In this part of Lecture 2, we will learn about Algol, COBOL, and LISP. IBM came to dominate about 90% of the mainframe computer market. The concern was severe enough that the United States Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit against IBM in 1969. The success of Fortran made a lot of computer professionals afraid that IBM would dominate the computer industry, which of course it did. GAM, the German Society of Applied Mathematics and Mechanics, worked together with ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, to develop an alternative to Fortran. They both organized committees that were to design universal languages. These efforts led to ALGOL, the Algorithmic Oriented Language. While the language never became popular in the United States, its derivatives included PL1, Pascal, C, and ADA. There were four specific goals for ALGOL. Firstly, it should be close to standard mathematics. Fortran had strayed a little from this, especially if you looked at how logical expressions were written. ALGOL should be useful in describing algorithms, something that was really not true about Fortran. ALGOL programs had to be compilable. This was essential because if they couldn't be translated into something that ran on a computer, the language would be useless. But this was a challenge in 1958, when most of what we know about automated translations of anything was still unknown. Algol should not have been tied to a single computer architecture. Fortran was heavily tied to the IBM 704, which had a strong influence on the design of several statements in Fortran. By decoupling the language from the hardware, it gave both the language designer and the computer architect more freedom in future design work. Algol saw some use in Europe and very limited use in the US, but it was important because of its influences on other languages. The most significant influence was in the use of a notation known as Bacchus NAR form, or BNF, which is used to specify syntax in programming languages. Also, Burroughs' use of prefix notation developed by Jan Lukasiewicz, helped lead to the use of stack-based architectures. This is now a standard part of any language's design. This is a sample of a program in Algol. We indicate here the size of the array A, as well as the result being passed back, which is Y, and the indices at which this value appears in the original matrix. Algol uses the colon and equal signs as an assignment operator, so the equal sign by itself can be used as a test of equality. By now they knew that using the same symbol for more than one purpose complicated the translation of the program. Also, statements end with a semicolon, allowing programs to be in a freer format with statements spread out over more than one line, and more than one statement on a line if desired although it was generally considered a bad idea by this time. The for loop appears here and is somewhat more readable than the do loop of Fortran. Very little thought was given as to how this would be executed on a computer. The Algol standard did not include input and output statements, which meant that each implementation handled it differently and therefore programs written for different Algol compilers were incompatible with each other. Nevertheless, many ideas that came out of Algol found their way into other languages, many of which are still popular today. The first application to run on the first commercially built computer was projecting the results of the 1952 presidential election for CBS News, and the computer was originally built for the Bureau of the Census. So the need for a language for business applications should surprise no one. The U.S. Defense Department sponsored the effort, which led to COBOL, the Common Business Oriented Language. It was standardized in 1960 and re-standardized several times. Part of the reason for its success was the obvious need for such a language, as well as the big push it got from Grace Murray Hopper, whose phlomatic language inspired much of it. COBOL succeeded for several reasons. The language is self-documenting. Well-written programs in COBOL do not necessarily need a lot of commenting, 
although it is available in COBOL, because programs written in it almost read like standard English. COBOL introduced the record structure, which made it very easy to organize data, something very important to the business community. The ability to format data was considered very important as well. If you have any doubt about that, take another look at any pre-printed statement that you've received. The picture clauses used in COBOL made it easy to maintain complete control over how numbers were displayed and printed. The syntax of COBOL has been a major influence on most database languages, including SQL. COBOL is also line-oriented and uses two margins. The A margin begins from columns 8 to 11, within which the names of various divisions, sections, and paragraphs must begin. And the B margin begins on or after column 12, where COBOL statements can appear. COBOL programs consist of four divisions, the Identification Division, the Environment Division, the Data Division, and the Procedure Division. The Identification Division allows the programmer to provide basic identification about the program, its use, its author, and so on. The only required item is the program ID, which contains the name of the program. One might choose to include the author's name, date written, date compiled, which is actually added to the program listing by the compiler. The Environment Division allows the user to add pertinent information about the environment the computer on which it is being compiled, the computer on which it will run. This is in the Configuration section. The Input-Output section allows the user to specify the files and devices being used, and to specify file organization, access mode, and other information. The Data Division is where the data used by the program is defined. Every data item must be specified, and the programmer can state the exact layout of each data item. The file that you see in this slide has standard labels, which pertain to files stored on tape. Files in COBOL are viewed as a collection of records, and usually requires that we know how many characters there are per record. Numeric entries are indicated in the picture clause by a 9. 9 with 5 in parentheses indicates 5 digits. I didn't have to write it this way. I could have written five nines if I chose, but this is shorter. The V that you see indicates where the decimal point goes if it is left out of the input. The X's indicate character data. Where you see the word filler is a field that will be ignored if they are in the input, or that where spaces will be skipped if they are in the output. The Z's indicate lead zeros. If the number is not large enough to require these extra spaces, they are replaced by lead zeros. There are other characters with which they can be replaced, including blank spaces, but they don't appear in this particular example. In addition to the data being read and written, there is also a place where you can specify the data that you use in the program, but never use for input or output. This is called working storage and does not require the usual information about the file. The Procedure Division is the remainder of the program, with the program's executable statements appearing here. COBOL programs are organized into paragraphs, and the standard convention is to have a number at the beginning of paragraph names. The main paragraphs typically have names beginning with numbers evenly divisible by 1,000, subsidiary paragraphs divisible by 100, and their subsidiary paragraphs divisible by 10. As you can see, the format for executable statements is very English-like, and typically they end with a period, not a semicolon as in ALGOL and its derived languages. COBOL has subprograms, but they are not so commonly used. What is more common is to write paragraphs that are called using perform statements, which is the main structuring mechanism for executable statements in COBOL. This dearth of control mechanisms is one of COBOL's weaknesses. That and the fact that it is very extremely verbose, with every data item being completely specified, and in general there is a lot of writing to be done, as you see here, where we are copying over one record into another. John McCarthy developed LISP at MIT in the late 1950s for use in artificial intelligence, 
Its main use is in the processing of data stored in lists. The language is a functional language, with everything essentially written as a function definition. Lists in Lisp are written in a format that is essentially the same as the programs themselves, enclosed in parentheses and separated by white space. There are, for all practical purposes, only two data types in Lisp, atoms, which are primitive data items, and lists. Lists are dynamically allocated, and the manner in which they are represented require that their garbage, memory that was no longer in use but not yet available for reuse, be collected and recycled. It also required the extensive use of recursion, and a lot of pioneering work in both problems were done in the implementation of Lisp interpreters. The very fact that the language is not imperative is a factor in its relatively slow execution speed on standard computers, all of which are at their core imperative in design. However, there have been computers designed on which they can run more efficiently. Many major AI programs, including Mycin, one of the earliest expert systems, have been written in Lisp. The list is the main data type in Lisp, which makes it stand out from so many other languages. They are typically implemented using linked lists. In the diagram on this slide, you will see that the list A, B, C, D contains four nodes, with each of them pointing to the place in memory where the data item on the list is stored. In addition, there is another pointer in each node, pointing to the next item on the list, except for the last one, whose pointer is null. The second list on the slide has the main list contain two items that are lists themselves, and the second one has a list within that. For this reason, the nodes point not to a data item, but to another linked list, implementing the list that is the next member of this list. In this way, a list can have members that are lists themselves, and so on, and there can be many lists embedded in other lists. APL is an anomalous language. Ken Iverson designed the language and wrote a book describing the language and wrote an interpreter for it. The main data type of the language is the matrix, and vectors are simply treated as matrices with the width of 1. APL has an extremely rich set of operators, most of them mathematical and many of them involving matrices. The operator set requires a special character set with a special keyboard, or at least a template for it, and for this reason it is extremely difficult to read. Here you see a typical APL keyboard. It becomes pretty easy to understand why it is so hard to read. The program that you see here finds all the prime numbers from 1 to R. The last term, terms are always evaluated right to left unless the order changes due to parentheses, creates an array of numbers from 1 to R. The down arrow drops the first value, which is 1. The left arrow sets R equal to this array of values. Then a matrix is created that represents a cross product with every multiple of 2 through 6. Then the vector is created with a 0 for the numbers missing in the matrix and 1 for the numbers that are in the matrix. The missing values are our prime numbers. It's easy to see why even Fortran, with its own readability issues, is considered more preferable for numeric work 